What an amazing opportunity to worship the Lord together, amen. What an awesome opportunity to worship God. We're going to talk about worship this morning. What is acceptable worship? Let me give you one more chance for those of you that would like the notes in Chinese. Please, let me get out of the way. Feel free to scan that code and have the notes there available in your heart language. What is acceptable worship? You see, what Paul had to say to that Corinthian church speaks very much what we're going to talk about this morning. What is acceptable worship? When the uh, people of the Corinthian church thought they were coming together in worship for the Lord at the Lord's table, they really weren't, Paul said. That their worship was not in an acceptable manner. What, what is acceptable worship? Worship. Have you ever thought about that? Here's our visual. We're going to start with our visual today. Everybody take your hands and hold them out in front of you like you're giving a gift to God. Now, if we were in the Old Testament time period, we would be holding a lamb or a goat or we'd have our hands on a bull or we'd be carrying two turtle doves or two young pigeons as a sacrifice, a worship offering to God. That's our visual for today. You can put your hands down. That's what I want you to think about. What is an acceptable manner of worship to Almighty God today? Because oftentimes, we don't think about that. We come and we praise God and we thank Him for all He's done, but we don't ask ourselves, how am I coming in worship? What am I bringing to the Lord in worship, God, how do I worship you in an acceptable manner? Because that's how we ended last week. Here's the verse that we ended with last week. We ended with this. It says, Hebrews 12, 28 and 29. Let's all read it together. Ready? Therefore, let us be grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, and thus let us offer to God acceptable worship with reverence and awe. For our God is a consuming fire. Let's pray. Father, we come before you right now wanting to know, would you speak from your word today? Would you meet with us and help us to truly understand what it means to offer you worship? Offer worship that is acceptable to you, that is pleasing in your sight. Father, we need you to teach from your word today. So God, would you meet with us? And not just with us, but as we continue to have the discipline of praying for other churches here in northern Thailand, Father, we want to lift up Church of Blessing. And Father, ask that Pastor Fung Tamakon, Lord, you know his name, that you would speak through him as well, that his word would be true, your word, and that you would meet with them even as we ask you to meet with us this morning. Father, help us to desire to give you worship that is acceptable to your name. And it's in the name of Jesus we come, the one who makes us right before you, makes us acceptable and pleasing in your sight, Father. It's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. So what is acceptable worship? Well, to help us figure out what God's Word is saying here, I want to remind you of a story of when Jesus was walking around not far from Capernaum, and he saw a tax collector, someone who was hated by most other Jews. He was, they were twice hated because a tax collector was someone who was a Jew who was collecting taxes from their own people to give to the oppressing Roman government. And in so doing, they would often cheat their own people and take extra money and put it in their pocket and make themselves wealthy. So they were twice hated by the Jews. But this tax collector was not hated by Jesus. Jesus saw him, and he understood that this man needed mercy. And so he went up to him and said, follow me. And the Bible says that man instantly got up and followed Jesus. Now, the Pharisees didn't understand this at all. In fact, a little later on, the Bible says the Pharisees looked in and Jesus was having dinner with many tax collectors, many sinners of all sorts. 
Pharisees pulled some of Jesus' disciples aside and said, why does your master eat with tax collectors and sinners? What they're asking is this, doesn't Jesus care about right and wrong? These are sinners. How can he be the son of God and not know that he's eating with sinners? But Jesus heard this. And Jesus recognized the condemnation in the heart of the Pharisees. And so Jesus responded instead of his disciples. And Jesus said this in Matthew chapter 9, verses 12 through 13. Jesus said, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. Go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. For I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. Look at that. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. Now the Pharisees understood what sacrifice was. That that's how they worshipped God. They were professional sacrificers. They were the ones that would tell others how to sacrifice, when to sacrifice, with what to sacrifice. They understood that that's how we worshiped God, but they didn't understand that when the Messiah came, the perfect sacrifice, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, when he was there in front of them, that system was gone and ended. And that Jesus says, I don't desire sacrifice in that way. I desire mercy. And he's quoting the Old Testament prophets that were pointing to this time and this, this heart of God, the blood of sheep and goats, the Hebrew writer says, never paid for the sins of man. It's only through Jesus and his blood that we have forgiveness at all. Jesus said, I desire mercy, not sacrifice. And when Jesus spoke to the woman at the well in John chapter 4, he told her this, the hour is coming and is now here when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for the Father is seeking such people to worship him. God is seeking worshipers. In modern church today, we often get praise and worship confused. We think that since we call it a worship service, and it is a form of worship, that this is all we need to do. That we come and we sing some songs and we hear a word and maybe give some money and hey, that's it, we're done. That's not the type of worshipers that Jesus is talking about. Jesus is talking about those who worship the Lord in His power, in the Spirit, in the spirit, the springs of living water that Jesus promised to this woman at the well. And in truth, the truth of knowing that it is Jesus Christ who paid for our sin. And that Jesus now lives within us, that we have died, and that Jesus now reigns and rules. And he desires mercy in how we treat other people. See, worship and how we relate to each other are intimately connected. That's why when Jesus answered the question, what is the greatest commandment? Jesus answered with two. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. These both sum up the law and the prophets, Jesus said. So what is it that we bring to God? worship? What are acceptable sacrifices to God? That's what the Hebrew writer is explaining to us this morning. Let's look now at our passage today. Hebrews chapter 13, verses 1 through 8. The Hebrew writer says, let brotherly love continue. Do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unawares. Remember those who are in prison, as though in prison with them, those who are, and those who are mistreated, since you also are in the body. Let marriage be held in honor among all, and let the marriage bed be undefiled, for God will judge the sexually immoral and adulterous. Keep your life free from money, from the love of money. Keep your life free from the love of money, and be content with what you have. For he has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. <clears throat> 
So we can confidently say, the Lord is my helper, I will not fear. What can man do to me? Remember your leaders, those who spoke to you the word of God. Consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. In the short time we have left, there's three things that I want you to see here in this passage. Three areas that the Hebrew writer says, these are the areas by which we truly worship God in an acceptable way to God as believers. Now, we know he's talking about worship of God, even though he's dealing with interpersonal relationships, because if you look at verse 16 of Hebrews chapter 13, he says it again. Do not neglect to do good and to share what you have, for such sacrifices are pleasing to God. Do you see it? How we interrelate with, relate with each other is a part of worship of God himself. When we worship God, it is displayed in three different ways. The first one is we worship God in loving people. The second is we worship God by hoping in the portion that he has for us. And the third is we worship God by faith in the one who possesses us. People, portion, possessor. Let's look at the first one. We worship God by loving people. Verses 1 through 3, it says, Let brotherly love continue. Do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unaware. Remember those who are in prison as though in prison with them, and those who are mistreated, since you also are in the body. He starts off, says, let brotherly love continue. That word literally means abide, remain, stay. Because the love of God, the brotherly love that we have for each other is from God's love for us. And it already exists in our heart. It's already been poured in our hearts, Romans chapter 5 says, by the Holy Spirit. So let it remain. Don't quench it. Don't push it aside. Don't ignore it. If we want to be true worshipers, we want to worry about what is acceptable to God. And when God says, let brother love remain, we are to say, yes, yeah, Lord, I want to worship you in this way. I want to seek out ways in which I can love others in a brotherly love way. The Apostle Paul, when he wrote his letters to the churches, many times declared, this is how I even know who is a true believer and who isn't. Let me just remind you, Colossians chapter 1, Paul says, we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and the love that you have for all the saints. Ephesians chapter 1, I have heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and your love towards all the saints. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. We ought always to give thanks to God for you, brothers, as is right. Why? Because your faith is growing abundantly and the love of every one of you for one another is increasing. Do you see it? God is saying, listen, how I want true worshipers to worship me in the first way is I want my love to flow through you to others. We actually worship God by how we love others. Many of us, especially in the Western church, think of worship as this one-way relationship. I go to church because I worship God, and I sure hope no one's sitting in my pew. You know, I mean, we have this mentality that as long as everyone leaves me alone, I can worship God. No, that's not the case. God says, you worship me by loving other people. And the proof of the genuineness of our faith in God is the fact that we are compelled by the Holy Spirit to seek out ways to love each other. Let brotherly love remain. And it's hard. Because we can look around at people and see that they don't deserve love. Oftentimes, that's the marker by which we decide whether or not we're going to love people. Do they deserve it or not? And we forget that what does Jesus say? I desire what? Mercy. Mercy is not giving them the punishment they deserve. And God says, I desire mercy, not sacrifice. You want to truly worship me? Be merciful. 
give mercy even if they don't deserve mercy. Because you know why? That's exactly how God loved us. Romans chapter 5, verse 8. The Bible says, God shows His love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. You know when that brother or that sister hurts you, says something nasty online or whatever, you are now being given an opportunity to show mercy, an opportunity to worship God by faith and trust that God, I'm going to obey you and let you handle the results. The Romans, Paul wrote to the Roman church and said, you know what, if you do this, the Holy Spirit will actually annoy that person. It'd be like heaping coals of fire on their head. But we don't focus on the fire, we focus on the mercy and say, God, do I truly want to worship you? See, praise is different than worship. Praise is just lifting our voices or our hearts or sometimes even our hands in declaration and thanksgiving of who God is and what He's done. It's different than worship. Worship is a sacrificial act to declare, God, you are truly my God, and I want to obey you with everything. The Hebrew word in, for, bow, for worship is the same as prostrate or bow before someone. The Greek word for worship literally means to kiss the hand, to, to, to bow down and, and show respect and honor to someone higher than you. To worship God is to put yourself in a position that says, God, by a sacrificial act, I declare you are my God. It's more than just singing songs. It's choosing to worship. And this takes faith. It really does. It takes remembering that while I was still a sinner, Christ died for me, and he didn't for me to become worthy before he gave me the, his love. No, while I was still unworthy, he poured his love on me. And he poured his love on you. So it's the non-waiting love that God wants us to pour on others, that brotherly love. Now, what does that look like? Well, the Hebrew writer gave us some wonderful examples. Open your home in hospitality even to those who can never repay you. Visit those in prison no matter what they may have done to get there and no matter what might happen to you if you go visit them. Remember in the first century church, many people were being arrested for their faith and if you went to minister to them in prison, you were labeled as a Christian as well. No, we don't worry about those things. We love like Jesus loved. Not seeking what we can get out of it, but what we can give because that is how God's love is clearly seen in us. And that takes faith. It literally takes a heart that wants to worship God. Because in order for us to be that humble before God, we have to believe that He'll meet our needs even when it doesn't feel that way at the time. Because, you know, sometimes we feel like we want something else, like justice and vengeance. But honestly, we want justice and vengeance for everyone else, but we want mercy. So God says, with the same mercy I've given you, give to them. That's how you worship me in an acceptable way. Trust me that I will meet your needs. Trust me that if you open your house in hospitality, I'll give you the resources you need to do that. I'll give you the time that you need to go visit people in prison. I will protect you. I will watch over you. I will care for you and give you what you need. And you know what? There might even be a special blessing in it just because I want to show you how much I love you. Look at verse 2 of Hebrews chapter 13. Do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unawares. This happened to Abraham, to Lot, to Manoah and his wife, and it happens today too. Countless stories of people who have really believed that they have interacted with angels. And they interacted with angels, how? Because they showed love and hospitality to a stranger they didn't know. And that stranger blessed them. You never know what God is doing 
And so a worshiper bows before God, doesn't look around to see what God might do. No, bows before God and says, God, I want to worship you in a way that's acceptable to you. I will love others. A worshiper loves God. A worshiper is hoping in the portion that God has for them. Let's look at the next one, verse 3, 4, and 6. Let marriage be held in honor among all. And let the marriage bed be undefiled. For God will judge the sexually immoral and adulterous. Keep your life free from love of money and be content with what you have. For he has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So we can confidently say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? True faith is content with what God has given them. Pornography, sexual immorality, adultery, these things are reaching beyond what God has given us in our relationships. It's the same heart as striving and craving for riches and wealth. It's saying, God, I'm not happy with what you've given me now. I want something else. And that is the opposite of a heart of worship. A heart of worship says, the Lord is my helper. He has given me what he wants me to have. Who can I fear? What can man do to me? I am in his presence, and I have what he has for me to shape me. We just went through all that passages the past several weeks about the discipline of God. He uses our marriages and our positions of wealth to shape us, to help us trust him in faith more. We need to be content with what God has, even if it doesn't seem like what we want. We trust that God knows what we want. He knows what we need, and He has given us our portion to shape our hearts. We don't look at others in blame and say, well, they made me do this, or they made me. No, we say, God, I trust you. I hope in that the portion you've given me. In our marriage, let me ask you this. Are you looking for your spouse to complete you? Or are you trusting in God? In your singleness, are you trusting that God has made you single for this time for His purposes and that He is enough for you, that He will always be with you? In our finances, our wealth or our poverty, are we truly believing that God is our provider and a sustainer and that money is just a tool? See, the problem comes when we reach beyond the portion that God has for us. We open ourselves up to such horrible cravings and desires that build up our flesh and then cause us to have to feed our flesh more and more to try to satiate desires that God never intended for us to have to deal with. Are we content with what God has? Do we have a heart of worship that says, what God has given me, He is good? That's the heart of worship that the Hebrew writer is talking about. And look at 1 Timothy chapter 6, speaking specifically of finances, but these cravings also deal with the same heart of sexual immorality, going outside the boundaries of marriage or singleness. Chapter 6, verses 6 through 10, Paul wrote to Timothy and said, Godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world, and we cannot take anything out of the world. But if we have food and clothing, with these we will be content. We're content with what God has given us. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation into a snare, into many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Not money itself. No, money is just a tool. The love of money, that desire to use that as our resource, to go beyond what God has and say, I want more, I need more. It is through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pangs. This is true of sexual immorality, and it is true of financial immorality to God. Not being content with what God has given us as our portion. 
And the Bible says you can get to the point where you're trying to feed these cravings, these unnatural cravings, these fleshly cravings that are beyond the portion that God has for us to the point that we can even struggle with our faith. We can be in such bondage that we don't even want to worship God. There's a danger there that we need to be aware of. See, our hope is not in our marriage to complete us. Christ completes us. Our hope is not in our singleness to say, okay, then this is who I am and, I, and I'm unhappy with what. No, I want to love and walk with God. He is my portion. He may have some of you single for the rest of your life. He may have a marriage person for you, but it's God's portion that he loves you with and he knows what you need. We, as an act of worship, a sacrificial act of worship, need to bring our hands up and say, God, I give you my life. I want to worship you. Worship people. Worship through our portion in hope that God has got it all because the third thing is also important. Our relationship with God is truly all we need. We love and have faith in our possessor, the one who bought us, the one who has always been faithful, the one who has been faithful even before he came on the earth is Jesus. He was faithful in the Old Testament to Abraham and Moses and Sarai and Enoch and all of those that we've talked about through the heroes of faith in chapter 11. Look at verses 7 and 8 now as we wrap up here. Hebrews 13. Remember your leaders, those who spoke to you of the word of God. Consider the outcome of the, their way of life and imitate their faith. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Now, I firmly believe that he's not talking about spiritual leaders in the church at this time. He, he mentions those later on in chapter 13. But in the full completion way in which this is written, the fullest past tense, I believe he's pointing back to chapter 11. And then quoting again, chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, where we're supposed to run the wraiths of faith with endurance, with our eyes fixed on who? Jesus. Looking to Jesus, the author and founder and perfecter of our faith, because he is the same yesterday, today, and forever. That same God that walked with Enoch, that same God that promised Abraham, I will be with you, you just go, and did it, protected Abraham until he reached the promised land. The same God that turned to Sarah and says, I know what you desire most of all. I'm going to give it to you. You're going to have a son. And he did. The same God that took Moses and said, walk with me, and you will lead my people into the promised land. And he did. He was faithful throughout everything that they went through. And that same Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So in closing, I just want to bring for you this thought. Take your hands now again. Let's lift them up. What do you have to worship God with today? What is it that God has spoken to you in your heart and said, will you give this to me? Because God is here right now. And he knows whether or not you're trusting in him or in things. He knows whether or not you're truly willing to lay down your life and give it to him and say, God, I will worship you through loving others. Whether they deserve it or not, I'm going to show mercy because that's what you want. Maybe he just wants you to fall in love with him again and say, I've always been faithful and I've never changed. Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Let's say that again and then let's pray. Say it with me. Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this 
word that you've given us this morning. How you've encouraged us to give acceptable worship to you. Father, thank you for reminding us of what that means. Father, forgive us for those times when we thought worship was just showing up on a Sunday morning. No, God, you want us to worship you every day, every moment of every day. You are seeking worshipers who will worship you Monday through Saturday just as much as we seek to worship you on Sunday. You're seeking worshipers that will worship you in your spirit and the power of your Holy Spirit pouring out love on others, pouring out love in our faith that this is what you've given us, pouring out faith in you and walking with you constantly. And the truth, knowing that you, God, you paid for our sins. And those of us who by faith have believed in you, Jesus, we've died with you. In the life we live now in this flesh, we live by faith in you because we know that you now live in us. Father, help us to worship you that way, in spirit and in truth. So, Father, when your word says you're seeking worshipers, help us to lift up our hands and say, God, I worship you because of what you've done for me. Father, let us be worshipers, true worshipers, acceptable worshipers because of what Jesus Christ has done. It's in his name we pray.